In the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who is and was and is to come. Please be seated. William Shakespeare wrote, The world is a stage, and we are all but actors upon it. Today, one of the characters of this Christmas uh, extravaganza is put before us. We hear uh, something from Joseph today, and it seems only appropriate where churches across Christendom are getting ready for various iterations of the Christmas spectacle that we call the pageant. They can be wonderful, they can be challenging. I had a friend who had live animals at their Christmas pageant, and they had a donkey with a gastrointestinal problem <laughs> one year that managed to misbehave in not one, but two services. The Church of St. John the Divine, uh, at a time when Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey still employed elephants, used to have the elephants from the circus for uh, St. Francis Sunday because the circus was always at Madison Square Garden on the first weekend in October. That's an exercise in faith if there ever was one. <laughs> we are here to examine briefly Joseph's role in this. I did some research about how actors are classified this week. You all want to know what it's like to have a bit part, right? We have a sense of what that means. I didn't realize that there are specific definitions for what qualifies as a bit part in a television show, both in England and here. In America, it's five lines or less. The British are a bit more gracious. It's six lines or less in Britain. Joseph qualifies as having a bit part. But to have a bit part is not necessarily to have an unimportant part. The Russian actor Konstantin Stanislavsky said, there are no small parts, only small actors. That doesn't mean short actors, it means that people who think that the only important part of the drama that unfolds before us as we enter into this process of uh, drama, the dramatic representation of any story to the world is the one that has the most lines. But I invite you to understand and to reflect on the fact that without Joseph's ascent to the plan of God that unfolded before us and we continue to proclaim in this holiday Christmas season, it would look very different. Mary takes center stage in Luke's gospel, and rightfully so, without her willingness to set aside her own personal standing in the community. This story could not have been told in the fashion that has become endearing to people through all, all throughout the world. Some years ago, I believe it was Diana Butler Bass was giving a presentation at St. Philip's Cathedral in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And there had been various people in the congregation who'd read different books by, well, one by a bishop of the church and another uh, by more orthodox theologians and wanted to debate whether or not the story happened just the way that it was written. And as the adults started conversing back and forth from one side to the other, she noticed uh, a teenager walking up the center aisle. And she said, what's, uh, what's going on? And in a quiet voice, the teenager said to Diana Butler Bassett, please tell us the story is true. Well, what makes it, you believe that it is true? He says, it's so beautiful that it has to be true. That we can, devolve into arguments about what actually happened and miss the greater truth that is in the biblical narrative. So we don't have to choose between Matthew or Luke as to who the angel appears, but we can recognize that God perhaps speaks to us all and oftentimes can speak to us 
in the voices of people who are most dear to us and at other times speak to us in the voice of the stranger. I heard one time the voice of wisdom and maturity from a young woman who was living in a halfway house talk about uh, her life. And her life had been challenged. She was uh, suffering from an addiction and as a result of her addiction had uh, lost custody of her children and was working very hard to get them back. And we were talking about the choices that she had made in her life with the things that had been given her and she said, I'm 23 years old and my whole life I felt like an understudy in my own story. And I don't know if she thinks about this as often as I do, but I think it was one of the most profound statements I've ever heard from anyone who was on a spiritual path to understand themselves and their role in the mission of God in the world. And her mission for her right then was small. It, encompassed this things that she could control and it seems entirely appropriate to me. Before we can land the big role to be all that, I think we first have to become comfortable in our own skin. We have to recognize that we are a mixture of blessings and liabilities. And if we're a mixed blessing, maybe it's most important for us to remember not that we're a mixture, but that we're ultimately a blessing. And that all the circumstances of our lives combine to help create and make us the people that we are today. Any of us of a certain age who have suffered a little bit will probably understand that we have learned as much and perhaps more through our suffering than through our successes. My spiritual mentor, Richard Rohr, makes the bold claim that after the age of 30, success has almost nothing to teach us. And at once that gives me great comfort, while at the same time wondering, is this the best it's ever going to be? <laughs> but Jesus, God in our lives, is always calling us forward into a deeper relationship with him, with the promise and the hope that is provided us that the best is yet to come. And whether it be on this side of the hereafter in the kingdom of God or on the other, we are destined for great things. And it all depends on how we choose to play the parts that we've been given in this drama that we call life. They say that life is what happens to us while we're making other plans, right? You want to hear God laugh? Tell him your plans for what might happen. I can just, I, I get the, the, the older I get and the older my children get, I think it's so quaint sometimes how God must think of me when I say, this is what is going to happen, God, I've got it all figured out. He goes, well, aren't you cute? <laughs> That's just precious. <laughs> Love you. Let me know how that works out. And we have to grow into who we are. The scriptural evidence is there that Jesus had to grow into who he was. He was convinced by his interactions with other people from across the spectrum, socioeconomically, religiously, and politically, that he had more to offer than the world than he ever dared to imagine, even being born the son of David the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one that was, as the scripture says today, to be named Jesus, the one who would save people from their sins. We all have a part to play in this ongoing story that has variously been called the greatest story ever told or the human drama written in divine terms. We all have parts to play in this. And just as Konstantin Stanislavski said, there are no small parts, only small actors. The part that you have to play, just like the part that Joseph had to play, the part that I have to play, the part that everyone around us is invited to play, is critically important to the story of God's kingdom represented to the world around us. That we have an important witness to offer.
Konstantin Stanislavski is not the only one that had something to say about bit parts. A person named Dabs Greer, who was a bit actor, once said, every character actor in their own little sphere is the lead. <laughs> what a comfort. We have all been called to take the lead role in the story that surrounds us as it pertains to the proclamation of the coming of, kingdom of, the, the, coming of the kingdom of God. John the Baptist came proclaiming a way in the wilderness. Various saints throughout history have proclaimed the coming of God's kingdom in their own way. But we all are bound to proclaim by the roles in which we've been cast that the kingdom of God is as near as our next breath. And the veil between heaven and hell is gossamer thin. And we can peer through it if we but wait and look and be still and know that God is in our midst. So as we turn on this day to the ensuing chaos that is bound to follow in the next three days, I invite us all to remember who we are. And for the sake of the mission of God, to stay in character. The worst thing you can ever do when you flub a line is to blow it and speak as yourself. The question is not whether or not we are going to blow it, but how we respond when we do. I thank heaven and earth that we serve the God of second, third, fourth, and fifth chances because I need every break I can get. In fact, at the eight o'clock service, I stepped all over Pat's line when it came to the Sanctus. I just was gonna barrel right through and say that bad boy, forgetting that we had music. I'm not all there is to this drama, but I'm important. So my prayer as we continue to act out the story of God in this world is that we will take the lead in our own little sphere and be the stars that God has created us to be. May we boldly go forth and proclaim the gospel in word and action, acting out the truth that is the hope of God, God with us, Emmanuel. <laughs>